Whether the team is giving us the highest of highs or the bluest of blue, we'll cover it all here The Commanders Nightly News. I, of course, am your host, Louis T. Thank you for joining me. Let's get to tonight's lead story. So Chase Young Watch continues as we near week number 11's contest versus the Houston Texans. He's had a full week of practice under his belt. The decision will be made. Ron Rivera had a conference call with the media today. I'll share some of what uh, was disclosed to us um, a little bit later on in the show. But, you know, in particular, pertaining to Chase Young, Ron Rivera said that the team will make a decision on Saturday, which has been the standard protocol for this team when deciding whether or not to activate someone off of IR. That decision usually is made on a Saturday before the game, and then that player usually plays on Sunday. Now, he has said with this Chase Young situation, it's slightly different because they could activate Chase Young off of IR on Saturday, but not necessarily play him on Sunday. They will make that determination on Sunday. So he'll be a true game time decision should they activate him on Saturday. Him being activated Saturday does not mean he will play against the Houston Texans. Ron made it a point of emphasis to stress that. Just because he's activated doesn't mean he's going to play. Unlike Brian Robinson and some of the other players that we've seen, like Tyler Larson, for instance, activated on Saturday off of IR, they played on Sunday. That is not the case for Chase Young necessarily. He could be activated tomorrow still not play against Houston. And I'm just going to be honest with you. I've seen clips and I, the clips can be deceiving because they're, you know, early practice reps. They're not, you know, team drills, they're individual, you know, uh, positional drills. So you you may not be going 110%. He didn't look like he was firing off the snap. He didn't look like he was ready to play in a game this coming Sunday. That's just my personal opinion. I think he's still a week away. And from what I've been told, okay, the the prevailing thought right now is they're going to just wait out another week because the D-line is playing so well. Because I don't want to say that they're overlooking the Texans because, hell, if that were the case, they would have tried to play him and they would have been pushing him to go against Philadelphia. I just feel like they think they're in a really good spot right now. There's no need to rush him back. They're not going to play him until he's ready. They've already stressed that. And another week would go a long way in helping him gain more confidence, more strength back in that knee. And that's what they ultimately are after is when they put him back on the field, they want him to be able to go full bore, you know, 110 percent balls to the wall, because that's the way Chase Young plays the, the game of football. And they don't want him playing it any less. So. I don't think he's playing this week, honestly. He could be activated on, on Saturday, still not play Sunday. I don't Whether he's activated or not really is of no consequence. It's whether he plays or not that's important. If he's not activated, clearly he's not going to be able to play. But if he's activated, he could still not play. I don't think he's going to play whether he's activated or not. I still don't think he's going to play regardless. But we We'll see. Just something to keep an eye on tomorrow as you're watching college football or you're, you know, out in the stores or you're out and about. You know, just keep a watchful eye as to what, you know, goes on with this Chase Young situation and whether or not he is activated off of IR. So in other news, uh, Ron Rivera spoke to uh, the media via a conference call. Uh, he's been doing that the last couple of Fridays, you know, before he was sitting down a little intimate setting with the media um, and, and answering questions in a, fi a rapid fire fashion. Um, I think they've uh, deci decided that it's probably easier for him to do it um, via conference call, especially when it's a road game. You know, you've got other things that you have to take care of and you've got travel going on. So um, we'll get to what was said, some of the... Um, pertinent parts of what Ron disclosed to the media today in a second. But let's take a look at the injury report for the upcoming game. This is the final one. And we'll quickly go through this because um, we, we know pretty much what we need to know from both teams. Neither of them posted their you know final um, injury reports uh, prior to this show, but Washington gave out the information that we needed. The Texans had not, but um, I was able to acquire the information that I needed off of the NFL website. And thus, um, pretty much everybody's playing. 
uh, in this game that you see on this list, with the exception of Neville Hewitt and Derek Stingley Jr. Those two are questionable. That means they could play. All right. They could play, but both are listed as questionable as of today. And so Stingley is the one that we're circling because he's a huge part of what they do defensively, obviously being a top five pick. Um, they think the world of this kid, he's been playing really well this season and he would pr more likely than not be the guy that predominantly covers Terry. If he's healthy, if he's not, I don't know if they've got anybody in that secondary that can cover any of our receivers for that matter. And, and even Derek Stingley Jr. will be in a lot of trouble having to cover Terry because Terry's a savvy, savvy veteran and he's a rookie. So there's still a lot for him to learn, even though he's a very very um, talented young corner. Um, it'll be interesting to see what happens if he can go. Hamstrings are really tricky. You guys know that we've dealt with those here with our team in particular and how you know you think you're feeling better and then something flares up with it. So we'll keep an eye on Derek Stingley Jr. Uh, but that's the big one for the Texans as you transition to Washington. Um, Everyone's playing on this list that you see in front of you with the exception of three guys. And we've talked about those three guys, two in particular, uh, one that we were really concerned about. And unfortunately, he's not going to be able to go. Cole Holcomb out. A lot of you um, left in the comment section that Cole was actually out on the field stretching with his teammates and off on the side field because I had made the comment yesterday that the thing that was so uh, troublesome for me with Cole and maybe he's a little bit further away than, you know, they're leading on is that he hasn't been out on the side field. He hasn't been out on the field stretching with his teammates prior to practice. That is something that we know when a guy is getting close, he's out stretching with his teammates and then he goes off to the side field and works there. That's a sign that he's getting close. Well, we haven't had that with Cole. A lot of you told me yesterday and reached out and said, hey, uh, he actually was on that side field. I went back and I did my homework and you guys are absolutely spot on for all of you who told me that information. Thank you so much for presenting that to me because I was not privy to that information prior to you guys uh, giving me that information. So um, this is why we're family. This is why I appreciate y'all because y'all clean up any messes that I may make. And so Cole did, in fact, stretch with the team yesterday, did uh, participate on the side field. So that means he's getting close. How close? I don't know. That gives me hope for next week. Obviously, he's out of this game, but that gives me hope for Atlanta next week. Um, as we near the bye week, it'd be great to get Cole Holcomb back uh, before the bye, whether it be Atlanta or the Giants game prior to the bye. J.D. McKissick is a totally different story. I told you guys I'm worried about J.D. McKissick. This is the same neck injury that, and I can't say for certain, I can't confirm nor deny that it's the exact same neck injury, but it's a neck injury. It's the same issue that he had last time in terms of a neck. Now, again, I don't know if it's the exact same thing going on with his neck, but he had a neck injury last year that cost him the final six games of the season. He's hasn't played in three weeks. He won't play this week. So, um, and he hasn't been um, out on the practice field. We haven't gotten any updates on JD. They're really tight lipped on him. And so uh, there's some concern there with JD McKissick. The good thing is we're extremely deep at the running back position. And, and so it's the, one of the few positions on the team that, you know, as long as we're relatively healthy, which we are, we'll, we'll be fine, you know, with Gibson and Robinson and Williams. And then if need be Jarrett Patterson, we're fine at the running back position. So um, JD can take as much time as he needs. Hopefully he gets healthy sooner rather than later, but he's out of this game. And then Amani Rogers, I talked about him looking very, very bad at the end of that Eagles game, limping around, did not want to put any weight on that right leg. Um, tried to give it a go, couldn't. They're going to keep him out of this game. Up comes Cole Turner. His opportunity will come this weekend on the road at Houston, and we'll see what he does with the opportunity that he will get. But no Amani Rogers in the lineup this coming Sunday. Everyone else is going to go on Sunday. Jonathan Williams, Antonio Gibson, Logan Thomas, Curtis Samuel, David Mayo is questionable, okay? But the likelihood is he's going to be able to go, but we'll see. Tyler Larson is going to be able to go. So um, no real concerns from Washington. Um, a lot of the guys that are out have been out, and then Amani Rogers is a guy that we were already kind of leaning towards, not thinking he would be able to play this week. So, um, that's the injury report for both teams. We'll see uh, what happens with Chase Young, obviously, on 
Sunday. So Saturday first and then Sunday as well. Um, Ron Rivera spoke to the media via conference call. Uh, two pieces of information in addition to the Chase Young um, information that I've already given you was really what was uh, put out there by the media. Um, so one thing he talked about was Jamin Davis's growth. And he talked about Jamin Davis wearing the green dot on his helmet on uh, Monday night's game versus the Eagles, which means he was the play, play caller. Somebody had brought that up. And I would, again, I wasn't privy to that information. That was news to me when someone told me that Jamin Davis, in fact, did have the green dot on his helmet. Because I remember very vividly um, a couple weeks ago when we played against Minnesota, um, the green dot was on the helmet of you know, Cam Curl. So I just assumed that's what they were going to continue to go with. But I guess Jamin had shown them enough. They were comfortable with the, the progress that he had made to, to put the green dot on his helmet. And I thought, well, maybe they'll just give it to John Bostic. You know, that's the thing that they've always uh, said about Bostic, that he's a coach on the field. You can get everybody lined up. They love that about him. So I just assumed if it's not Cam Curl, it'll be a guy like John Bostic. But they gave it to Jamin Davis. He played every single defensive snap. I think that's the first time in his career he's ever done that. And so um, you're seeing the growth. You're seeing the maturation of Jamin Davis. He's growing right before our very eyes. This is exactly what they were hoping for. This is what we were hoping for as a fan base. And one of the things Ron said is that they they learned how to coach him. You know, took them a little while um, and they figured out that he's a guy that you have to ride. He's a pause. He's a guy that you have to be hard on. All right. You have to light a fire under his ass. And I think Jack said, or, or Ron to some degree said that Jack got in his ass. Pause again. Um, but really, you know, started to to lay into him and he responded to that. We we all know about, you know, Jack challenging him, Ron challenging him in the media. We all thought that there was a cryptic, you know, post on IG that was put out there. We talked about it on this show. It turned out to be nothing, as they said, but we didn't believe them. I know I didn't, most certainly, at the time, but it turned out to be nothing. It turned out to be the way that they needed to motivate him. It worked, and he's taken off from that point forward. So they figured out the Rubik's Cube that is Jamin Davis, and now uh, they're, they're reaping the benefits of that. So um, that's great to see. He also talked about, you know, the emergence of Defoe, Derek Forrest, at the safety position. He is a guy that they have to have on the field now at this point. We've seen the growth. We've seen his maturation. We've seen the playmaking ability. As I mentioned, he leads the team in interceptions. He's um, probably leading the team in forced fumbles as well. I mean, I, I can't think of many forced fumbles that we've had this season, but I know he's forced two for sure. Um, so uh, he's a guy that right now he's necessary on the field defensively. And Jack or Ron said as much, and he's like, Bobby McCain is now the new nickel. That's going to be his new role. And remember, Bobby McCain, by trade, naturally, is a corner. He came to the NFL as a corner coming out of the University of Memphis. So it's not like Bobby McCain isn't capable of playing the cornerback position. That's what he was in college. That's what he came to the NFL as and then the Dolphins decided to make him a safety because they wanted to keep him on the field. So Bobby McCain should be comfortable making that transition. He's been playing a ton of safety. So um, I won't say it's a tough transition, but him just playing nickel might be a bit of a transition for him. But it shouldn't be too difficult. He's done it in the past. And um, I, I love it. I'm glad because we were having issues at nickel. Now I want to see him actually thrive because... I didn't love the coverage he had against um, Quez Watkins on a third down where he was playing off. And again, you don't want to give up anything cheap and deep. You know, you rather keep it in front of you and make the tackle. But he was often soft. He was scared. You could tell you didn't want to give up anything. It was too easy on third down. I want to see him be more aggressive, challenge receivers, and, and see if he can really play the nickel. Or is he just a guy that they are comfortable being having on the field? You know, and he's not necessarily um, a, 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 you know, real piece at the nickel position. We'll find out uh, what what Bobby McCain is made of inside as the weeks progress. But uh, that's the, the the move, you know, moving forward. Defoe 
as the starting free safety, Bobby McCain now as your nickel defender. So Ron made it that, um, you know, official. Like this is, the, this is where we're going. This is the direction we're moving in um, for the rest of the season. You know, Derek Forrest is a fixture on this defense now. That's music to our ears. So um, that was the extent of what Ron pretty much said, or at least what we uh, have been told by the media members that were on that conference call. So with that said, let's jump into the game plan and talk about this game against the Texans. Washington comes into the game at 5-5, five and five, Texans 1-7-1. One, and one. Um they're a dangerous team. They got nothing to lose. I talked about that angle that you take as a team when you go into a game, no one's expecting. This is usually every week for the Texans. Nobody's expecting them to win. Um, it's not the same degree of difficulty that we had a week ago when we were 11-point underdogs against an undefeated Philadelphia Eagles team. But every week they go into games, nobody's expecting them to win, and they have that us against the world mentality. We got nothing to lose. Let's just go out here and see what we can get done. And so you have to guard against that if you're Washington. You can't allow them to gain confidence. The worst thing you can do with a bad football team that struggles is to give them confidence, to allow them to hang around and feel like they got an opportunity to steal one. Um, at some point, you have to foot, put foots on necks, knees on throats, whatever you have to do to you keep them at bay, you do it. And whether we start slow or not, at some point, you have to pull away from them. I'd like to start quickly, but honestly speaking, you want to be able to, to establish that this ain't your day. You know, maybe next week, but today ain't your day. Um, it, was, it was fun watching, you know, um, the episode of Command Center this week with Ron Rivera um, and, and Logan Paulson and, and them breaking down the film of the Texans in particular um, because there were some interesting tidbits that you were able to gather there. So if you're not watching the command center, um, the best episodes are the ones where Ron Rivera, and that's usually the Thursday episode, if I'm not mistaken, where Ron Rivera, um, jumps in there. They look at some film from the past game, and then they look at some film. They go to Rivera's office, sit down, watch a little bit of film of the upcoming opponent. So, um, and they talked about how the Texans, stop the run and, and what they have to do to be able to stop the run. And it, it seems like something we will be able to take advantage of. And when they usually look to stop the run, they usually play either man coverage or some form of a cover three that turns into a, a match coverage, right? So um, that's something that we can take advantage of. If we get those looks... They think it's a run, you sell run, and then you go play action fake. There will be some opportunities, I think, for us to take advantage of some of the coverages that the Texans will give us. Um, they have to sell out to stop the run. And I think we will be able to have some success. Teams have had success against them on the ground. I've talked about that already. And so um, it will be nice if we can imp impose our will on them on the ground to really establish that run game take the ball out of Taylor Heineke's hands um, until we need him to, to make a play. You don't, again, you know, the, the key to whomever is under center, whether it's him or Carson Wentz, is to minimize how many times they have to drop back and throw the football. So if we can run it effectively, limit Taylor Heineke's attempts. What did he have in the game against Philadelphia? You know, 27 attempts? Uh, I'm curious. I think that was the number. But... We, we obviously when you run it 40 whatever times um, you put yourself in a position to not have to throw it a whole hell of a lot but let's see I think Heineke was like 20 was 17 of like 26 or something let's check and see 17 of 29 okay so I'm perfectly fine with anything under 30 I've told you that's the sweet spot really 27 I think I said 27 to 33 attempts is 33 is the max that I would like either quarterback, you know, throwing. I don't want them throwing it any more than that. I would prefer them to be 
in that 27 to really 24 to 27 range is really ideal. But in today's NFL, it's hard to have your quarterback throw the football less than, you know, 25 times unless you're really getting it done on the ground or you're getting explosive plays and you're not having as many, you know, play opportunities. And so whatever the case may be, running the football is paramount for Washington this week. You know, take that pressure off of the quarterback. Really put the pressure and the onus on the Texans to stop the run, forcing them to be over aggressive. Bring that eighth defender into the box, and then you get one on ones. Um, and, and then you seek out the one that makes the most sense and you attack it. I think we'll have some opportunities to do that. If we're able to establish the run early and often in this game, it will open up opportunities because the Texans will then have to be over aggressive in their pursuit to stop the run and that's when you'll get opportunities to drive the football down the field something that i heard during the week um and i love the fact that um i'm trying to think of his name i don't know why i'm blanking but it's one of jp's boys from the podcast um he kept asking everyone about slants you know, he asked Ron about slants to Terry. He asked Scott Turner uh, about slants to Terry. He asked Terry about slants to Terry. And I thought it just, it cast a massive light. It shined a massive light on the fact that we need more slants. Terry is extremely effective in the slant game. We haven't, we didn't get our first Terry McLaurin slant, okay, until week number six versus the Bears. Like, that's asinine for how good terry is in the slant game we didn't get our first one until week six and and so now they figured out oh yeah this is a really good tool for us pete haley that's his name pete haley uh, was the one that kept asking the slant question and usually when guys do that they're writing a story you know and and so that they want answers from various people so they can put it in their story but i was just glad he was doing it because it, it it brought awareness to something that we need more of which is the you know, the slants to Terry. And I think there'll be opportunities for that in this game. And if we catch them napping and catch them sleeping in an aggressive coverage, it could be 88 and out the gate, you know. So we'll see what happens. I think establishing the run is the first thing that we must do in this football game. Obviously, the one thing you really don't want to do is turn the football over. It'd be nice to stay clean. I Look, at this point, I told you guys, I don't. All I ask for is that you stay clean, but I don't expect it especially with Heineke at quarterback, there's going to be one foobar in there somewhere. You know, he's thrown a pick in every single game. He even added in a fumble last game. Again, that was not his fault. There was nothing he could do about that. But, um, you know, he almost had a fumble against Green Bay, had the fumble against the Eagles, threw a pick in all three of his starts, or four rather, um, in the uh, Packers game, the Colts game, the Vikings game, and the Eagles game. So I just, I assume, I expect a turnover okay if you turn it over once fine all right but that's not the goal the goal is to be clean same thing with the defense and special teams i'm not anticipating nor expecting a turnover however we're playing a team that is very generous they do not mind sharing so why not help them in their pursuit to be very caring during this time of giving and thanks i'd love to say thanks for them giving us an opportunity So why not take advantage if they're offering it up? Go ahead and take it. But the biggest thing we have to do is protect the football. If we play a clean game, I find it very hard to believe that the Texans can beat us. I find it very hard to believe that they can beat us. Over the last six games that Washington has played, we are right now sixth in the amount of points given up per game. Like, we're not giving up points. I've talked about this already. If we would have just scored 26 points every game this season, right now we'd be 9-1. and one. The only game we gave up more than 26 points was the Detroit Lions in Week 2. Other than that, we haven't surrendered more than... T- so, over the last six games, opponents aren't scoring the Brock on us, okay? If, if you go back six games, we're in Week number 11. That would start with the Titans in Week 5. You're, you, the Titans scored 21 points. The following week, the Bears scored seven points. The week after that, the Packers scored 21 points. The week after that, the Indianapolis Colts scored 16 points. The week after that, the Minnesota Vikings scored 20 points. The week after that, the uh, Philadelphia Eagles scored 21 points. Like, 
we're not giving up any more than 21 points is essentially what I'm trying to convey to you. Okay. So when, when the averages come out, we're giving up less than 20 points a game over the last six games, which is good for sixth in the league. And we're giving up yards wise. We gave up less than 250 yards of total offense to the Philadelphia Eagles on Monday night. This was a high octane offense moving it up and down the field and we gave up less than 250. Right now, we're third in the league in total yardage given up in that same six-game stretch. So if we can, if we can do that to, to the Vikings, who's a high-powered offense, to these Eagles, you know, to the Philadelphia Eagles, another high-powered offense. If we can do that to the likes of teams like that, I, I surmise that we should be able to make it tough on the Houston Texans. And that's the goal. It, I talked about them being an inferior third down offense. Okay, well, let's make sure that they stay that way. We're one of the best third down defenses in the business. Let's showcase that in this game. Get off the field. If you're not creating turnovers, that's fine. Get off the field on third downs. Get off the field on third downs. Get the ball back to your offense and give them opportunities to rock and roll. The biggest things for me are don't help the Texans. Make them beat you themselves because I don't think they're capable of doing it on their own. They, In order for them to win, similar to the way we had to beat Philadelphia, we had to play a damn near perfect game, and we did turn it over twice. But everything else was, was to, to perfect execution, right? Like to, to the script, to a T. Keep them off the field, time of possession, two to one. You know, all of that good stuff, 12 is 21 on third downs. Like we did what we set out to do. And then we got help four turnovers we can't turn it over make them beat us themselves execute get off the field on third downs get after davis mills he's a guy that will hold on to the football he's proven that throughout his career he will hold on to it a tick or two longer than he should that's when the mistakes happen that's when the fumbles happen that's when the forced throws happen in the interceptions get to davis mills in order to do that, you have to stop the run first. That's going to be the biggest key to this game defensively is to shut down. And look, you don't have to shut down Damian Pierce because he's a really good rookie running back, man. This class of rookie runners is special. And it would have been even more special had Brees Hall stayed healthy because he was doing extraordinary things for the Jets. We see what uh, Kenneth Walker is doing for the Seahawks. Damian Pierce is right in that group. They were all taken in the second round. If we slow him down, it puts all of the onus on the shoulders of Davis Mills. And Davis Mills isn't prepared to carry a team to victory by himself. So slow down the running, running game and the rushing attack of the Texans, which will allow you to then get after Davis Mills and hopefully create a, a turnover or two, a mistake or two, or if, if at worst case, get you off the field on third downs, get you into some third and longs and, you know, get him to be errant and, and you get the football back. Either way, it starts with stopping the run. Attack that cover two defense. You're going to get cover two from them. On third downs in particular, they love to run cover two. You're going to get a number of cover two looks. They'll mix it up here and there. You'll get man every now and again. You'll get cover three. You'll get quarters coverage. You'll do, you, look, every team in the league mixes it up. But they play a lot of cover two. Okay? A lot of cover two. Lovey Smith believes in the cover two defense. Through and through. You're going to get it. Attack it. Understand what they're looking to do. Understand the reads of the cover two. What that corner's doing. If he sinks, take the underneath. If he is is if he's underneath, all right, if he stands pat, you go over the top of him. Like understand what your reads are and attack them. Make them wrong whatever they decide to do. So to me, this is pretty simple. I don't we don't need to discuss this for 30 minutes. Run the football, establish the run against a team that has struggled to stop the run this season. 
that's going to force them to be over aggressive to stop the run. That will give you opportunities down the field. Convert on third downs. By running the football on first and second down, by establishing the rushing attack like you did against Philadelphia, it will give you opportunities to convert third downs and also will give you opportunities on first down to take shots, to go play action fake and to take shots down the field. Don't turn the football over. Don't help them. Play a clean game if at all possible. If you're going to make a mistake, one, that's it, okay? You hope that it's not a costly one at the most inopportune time of the game, which it always seems to happen with Heineke in the fourth quarter. But limit the mistakes. That's how they're going to beat you if they're going to beat us. Limit the mistakes. Okay? Limit the penalties. Don't give them help. Attack their defense. That secondary is prime for the picking. Attack their secondary. If you run it, it's going to open up opportunities. Take advantage. And when those advantages present themselves, don't miss. Don't miss. And one thing I can say about Heineke, he hasn't really. When he's gotten opportunities, he hasn't really missed. Defensively, slow down Damian Pierce. I don't think you're going to be able to stop him completely because he's such a good back. And they they are dedicated to running the football. So you're not going to stop him. Slow him down. Okay, if he has 22 carries, make it for 78 yards. Okay, make them work and make Davis Mills have to beat you. You do that. I like our chances in this football game, which takes me to the final outcome. I know a lot of you want to blow out victory. You want to you want a statement game from this team. And that'd be great. And I'd be lying to you if I said I wouldn't like a statement game where we're comfortably ahead in the fourth quarter. We're not sweating anything out. But I'm not a fool, okay? I'm no dummy. Mama didn't raise no fool. I've seen this team in action. This feels a little bit different, but I've said that before, and shit hasn't been different. I'm I'm in wait-and-see mode. I do know this. I'm attaching expectations to hope this week. That's always dangerous for me. It's always uncomfortable for me. But I'm going out on a limb and I'm going to do it because I expect this team to deliver in this football game 26 to 17. It's not going to be as comfortable as I like it to be. You know, they're going to be right within striking distance with around seven minutes to go in this game. 23 to 17. They're right there. We're we're sitting on pins and needles. They're one play away from taking the lead 24 to 20, you know, three. And then we put together a pseudo drive with about 748 left that takes us right around the three-minute mark of the game, 247, kick a field goal, go up nine, and that's uh, essentially how the game really ends. The defense comes out, the Texans uh, try to move the football, at least get in the field goal range, give themselves a chance to kick an onside kick. We shut that down, and we win the game 26-17. to 17. Uh, What's your score and more? Leave it down in the comment section. Can't wait to read what you guys have to say and what you think is going to transpire in this game, but... At the end of the day, I don't care how it is achieved. Just leave this game six and five at all costs. Okay, just get it done. That's all I care about. Don't care how it looks or how it comes. Just leave this game one game over 500. That is all. That is it. That's going to do it for me, your man Louis T here on Commander's Nightly News. Can't wait to hear from you guys as to what you think is going to happen in this game. Keep your eyes peeled, ears open as to what happens with Chase Young. I, I, I'm thinking and I'm being told that next week is the week. Okay, He may be activated this week, but th- the plan is to not play him this week against the Texans. I don't think they honestly want to start him off on a, an artificial surface. I think they want him to come back, play his first game on a natural surface which FedEx Field is. So I think they're going to hold him out one more week, give him time to continue to heal, get more practice under his belt, get his legs more acclimated, and then they're going to turn him loose next week against the Atlanta Falcons. That's the the prevailing thought, but we will see. Until then, you guys enjoy your weekend. We'll be here chopping it up Sunday for the game. If you're in the MOBB, 
We'll be here watching it together, and I'll see the rest of you for the post-game show after it's all said and done, and hopefully talking about a good guy's victory. Till then, have a good one. Here comes the diesel. Here comes the diesel. There's the snap, hand to Riggins. Good hole. He's got the first down to the 40. He's gone. The 35, the 30, the 40. He's gone.